All right, class. Now we talk about the nervous system. This is this is fun. Uh, um, you'll learn a lot about your brain and how crazy it is. <laughs> All right. So let's look at some fun facts about your brain. Your brain consumes 20% of your oxygen, but it counts for only 20% or 2% of your body mass. Your brain can generate 10 to 25 watts of power. That's enough to power a light bulb. Your brain is more active when you're asleep than you're when you're awake. So sleep is actually very important to organize your thoughts. Your brain is the reason you don't notice when you're blinking. It illuminates the world while your eyes are closed some 20,000 times each day. Human beings have the wrinkliest brains of any species. These wrinkles are aligned to sophisticated neural pathways and higher intelligence. On an average day, human being has over 70,000 thoughts. The brain doesn't have pain receptors. Okay, so this is very important. That's why brain surgery can be performed on a conscious patient. In some countries, they eat live monkey brains. You ever watch uh, Indiana Jones and the Temple of uh, uh, Doom, where they show this, uh, they go to India and they're eating monkey brains? Well, Indians are vegetarian, so that, that movie itself was uh, kind of crazy. Um, but a woman's brain can shrink when she's pregnant. It can take her up to six months to recover from pregnancy brain. You can't tickle yourself, try it right now, because the brain distinguishes between your own touch and someone else's touch. And your brain contains enough fluid to fill a 1.5 liter bottle. Whoa, check this out. Thinking, whoa, what's going on here? Is this my brain or was it the drugs that you take? <laughs> You're thinking, oh dang Patel, all right, all right. But this is, this is called the Moore effect, and you're thinking, what's going on? Well, let's see what's going on here. So, what is the Moore effect? Scientists have several theories about how your eyes and brain collaborate to create the illusion of movement, although the pre precise neural mechanisms remain unknown. So, to begin with, when we fixate on a pattern, such as what you saw, it momentarily remains on our retinas as an after image. So one theory is that small involuntary eye movements cause this ghost image to overlap with the image on the page. So the result is what you get is called the Moore effect. So what that is, is similar repetitive patterns merged together at slightly different angles, creating a rippling effect. Just like this, right? So what you're seeing is an after image in your retina and you're just thinking, what's going on here what's moving here like is it moving is it not moving uh all right get off this page right all right and that's the introduction to the nervous system in the brain Are you excited yeah it's cool stuff uh neurobiology is the study of the nervous system it includes neuroanatomy and neurophysiology the nervous system functions include sensory perception integration and motor planning so there's two main divisions. You have the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, which is the nerves and ganglia. So here's a nice little breakdown for you. So again, the central nervous system, that's the brain and spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system, so that's divided into sensory and motor. Okay, so sensory would be visceral sensory division, which is your internal organs, somatic sensory division, then you have a motor division, which is your visceral motor division, and then your somatic motor division. Okay, and then your visceral motor has a sympathetic and a parasympathetic. So sympathetic is your fight or flight, and your parasympathetic is your rest and digest system. So a lot going on in the nervous system, and we'll talk about each one individually. Now the <laughs> central and peripheral nervous system, the structures of the peripheral nervous system are prefer, referred to as ganglia and nerves, which can be seen as distinct structures. The equivalent structures in the CNS are not obvious from this overall perspective and are best examined in prepared tissue under the microscope. Ooh, check this out. Here's gray matter and here's white matter. That's a human brain. A brain removed from an autopsy with a partial section removed shows white matter surrounded by gray matter. 
So gray matter makes up the outer cortex of the brain. Okay. That's unmyelinated and white matter is myelinated. And we'll talk about the difference between the two. So afferent versus efferent. Afferent, somatic, sensory, so carries signals from receptors in the skin, muscles, bones, and joints to your brain, central nervous system, right? So you have to have something that carries all this information. Those are somatic sensory, afferent. You have visceral sensory afferent that carries signals from your viscera, such as your heart, lung, stomach, and bladder, to your brain. Well, then the brain has to send signals. So then you have somatic motor efferent, which carries signals to muscles and is voluntary. But then you have visceral motor efferent, aka your autonomic nervous system, which carries involuntary movements to your glands, cardiac smooth muscle. All right, so let's say your pupils start to dilate, your palms get sweaty, and your heart rate starts to uh, beat a little bit faster when you're ready to take a midterm or a quiz. Well, that's autonomic nervous system. You cannot control that. But let's say you're at the beach and you want to flex your uh, muscles. Well, the brain says, okay, go ahead and flex. All right, so that's the difference between voluntary and involuntary. Now, <clears throat> there's two divisions of the autonomic nervous system. There's the sympathetic, which is your fight or flight, which increases your heartbeat, increases respiratory, but inhibits digestion, such as nicotine, cocaine, and caffeine. So meaning when you're ready to run from a bear, you don't have time to digest food. So <clears throat> nicotine, cocaine, and caffeine work the same way. They work the autonomic nervous system, fight or flight. Parasympathetic, that's your rest and digest. They decrease the heart rate. They decrease your respiratory. So that, that's how motion sickness drugs work, atropine, sarin gas, VX gas, and tear gas. They all work this way. Okay, so again, these are just examples. We'll talk about neurotransmitters in a little bit. All right, so here's a good little image here. Here's the brain, which is the central nervous system. Perception and processing of sensory stimuli, somatic, autonomic. Execution of voluntary motor responses, somatic. Regulation of homeostatic mechanisms, autonomic. The nerves in the peripheral nervous system, fibers of sensory and motor, they can be somatic or autonomic. The digestive tract, that's the enteric nervous system. We'll talk about uh, that when we do the digestive system, but locating the digestive tract is responsible for autonomous functions. It can operate independently of the brain and spinal cord. The spinal cord itself, initiative reflexes from ventral horn, somatic and lateral horn, autonomic, gray matter. Pathways for sensory and motor functions between periphery and brain. And the ganglia in the peripheral nervous system, reception of sensory stimuli by dorsal root and cranial ganglia somatic and autonomic relay of visceral motor responses by autonomic ganglia. So somatic structures include the spinal nerves, both motor and sensory fibers, as well as sensory ganglia. Autonomic structures are found in the nerves also, but include the sympathetic and parasympathetic ganglia. The enteric nervous system includes the nervous tissue within the organ. So remember the difference between somatic and autonomic. Okay, so again, <clears throat> somatic, is carries signals from receptors in the skin, muscles, bones, joints to the central nervous system. So that's afferent. And the somatic motor carries signals to the muscles. Okay. A nerve cell is a neuron. Uh, fundamental physiological properties. Uh, neurons can be excitable. They, they have conductivity and they secrete. They release chemical messages called neurotransmitters, and we'll talk more about those. They can respond to stimuli and they can send signals to distant locations very quickly. Now, if you look at functional class of neurons, sensory afferent neurons detect stimuli. So let's say you get poked or you touch something hot. So the sensory afferent neurons conduct signals from receptors to the central nervous system. So um, there we go. And we'll talk more about what these neurons are. And then you have an interneuron, which are confined to the central nervous system. So interneurons, about 90%, receive signals from other neurons and make decisions about the response. So they say, okay, what should we do about this response? All right. And then 
efferent neurons send signals to the muscles to provide response. So then these guys will say, hey, dummy, that's hot or that's painful. Well, why don't you contract your biceps and triceps and remove it? So then you get a neuron conduct signals from the central nervous system to effectors such as muscles and glands. So here's the stimuli, interneuron interprets what you do, and then bam, it does it. Obviously, there's time. So imagine when, remember when you, if you cut yourself, like say, and you see the blood coming out, right? And you're thinking, oh, that's going to hurt. So it goes here, then it, uh, the interneuron says, oh yeah, and then you get the sensation or you get the, so there is a delay a little bit, and you know that delay, but um, that's how it works. A neurosoma, the soma or cell body control center. Chromatophilic substance, those are the nissle bodies. They're compartmentalized rough ER. Dendrites receive signals. Axons, they send action potentials. The terminal arborizations, complex of branches of axons distal end. And the axon terminal, terminal button, ending of axonal branch that communicates with another cell. So here's the cell body. Here's the axon. Here's a legro dendrite. There's the nodes or a mirror. Here's a myelin sheet. It's like insulation on a wire. And there's the synapse. So these are the major parts of the neuron labeled on a multipolar neuron from the central nervous system. These are the little dendrites. So can nerve cells regenerate? Um, unfortunately, mature neurons lack centrioles and therefore apparently undergo no further mitosis. But neurons are usually long-lived. They can live over 100 years, so you're, you're good to go. Uh, unspecialized stem cells in the central nervous system that can convert to nervous tissue, but is very limited. Okay, So most mature neurons, uh, they lack centrioles, and therefore they don't undergo mitosis, and therefore it's very difficult or slim to zero chance that you get cancer of the brain in neurons. Now glial cells, those are different. Those go under mitosis, so usually a glioblastoma is common, and that is uh, the type of brain cancer that you can get. So here's a representative neuron. Um, again, these are the dendrites. Here's the neurosoma. Here's the nucleus, nucleolus. Here's the axon. Here's the axon hillock. Axon hillock joins the axon and the soma. Okay, and then these are the myelin sheets. So you're probably thinking, okay, Patel, it's been in the midterm. I need I need help remembering all this stuff. You know, uh, how does my brain work? So now. If you, if you look at this Epinghaus forgetting curve, how much of something we forget each day, it's not even each day, it's almost a, in a matter of minutes. So let's say you take this lecture, you, you in about 20 minutes, you're only going to remember 58% of it. In one hour, you're only going to remember 44%. And within an hour, you forget 44% of what you just learned. In one day, you only remember 33%. In six days, you only live uh, learn 25%. And then here's the problem is that let's say you only meet once a week or you have a quiz uh, once a week. Well, what happens is most students procrastinate and they'll wait for the day before to start studying. And what will happen is you'll only study what you remember or what you think is important. So that's only of about 25% of it. So really, you, when you pull an all-nighter or the day before, you you're like, oh yeah, I remember Patel said something that was important. You only remember 25% of what's important. So you're really wasting a lot of time. Really, you should study a little bit every day so that you don't forget. Because when it comes to day six, you only remember 25% from the class. So how do you improve your memory? Um, better memory representation organizations such as mnemonics. You know, intelligent people make awesome tacos. Some lovers try position that they can't handle. So you remember the first letter and make a mnemonic and you'll be able to remember such things. Active recall. Walk yourself through the house, right? So you, you open the door, you go in the living room. Oh, there's a neuron there. Uh, when uh, the neuron is sitting on the couch. Then as I walk through the kitchen, well, the axon hillock is the connector between the axon and the kitchen. Right, so the, the, walking yourself uh, uh, through is actively walking through a house and remembering parts of the house and associating parts of a muscle or uh, parts of the brain through that will give you an active recall. 
And you should study within the first 24 hours of material presented. I know that some of you say, oh, I work, Patel. I do this. But you do get a 10, 15 minute uh, break in between. All you, that's all you need. Just a little bit here, a little bit there. What happens is when you sit down for hours on end and try to, that's a waste of time. Instead, if you're doing pockets of 10, 15 minutes of studying, that would be much better.